everybody, I'm Ashley Graham, and this is Pretty Big Deal, where confidence is key. Every episode, I get to pick the brains of brilliant, inspiring, honest, new and old friends who are a pretty big deal. Today, we're talking to the fashion icon and Harlem legend, Dapper Dan. Dap has returned to the mainstream, reopened his Harlem Atelier, and taken his rightful seat at the table in the fashion industry. Dapper Dan is in the house. What? Yeah. Whoop, whoop. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here. Well, I'm happy. Just being around you, let me tell you something. You are Aww. truly amazing. Aww. I'm not used to this because I live like in a cocoon for 20 years. I, you know, I'm a real product of my community, right? So only the last four years, like five years, since I came out of the underground, have I ever getting, had a chance to engage the people who I'm talking to now. My only relationship with people who I'm meeting now is through books. Mm. You know, other than that, there when I'm in Harlem, I'm talking Harlem stuff, and I'm always there. So anything that's inside of me, that's outside of that, I had to get from books. And so now to get real life, people like for the last, since I came out of the underground, everyone, my son verified verify this, everybody who's came and interviewed me, when we're done, I interviewed them because I couldn't understand what it was about me that they found like so interesting. In fact, I researched myself, so I'm, I'm looking up Dapper Dan and seeing what we people got Google saying. alerts? Yeah, so I'm seeing what people t- are saying about me, and I come across this book, and the title of the book is Remixing the Classroom, a way uh, of this new form of learning, right? And so this professor at Columbia University School of Music, and he teaches the um, graduate course in, mm-hmm. in music. And I come across the book, and the first chapter of the book is he's showing graduate students how to learn based on what he learned from me from reading the New Yorker article from when I came out the underground. I say, I got to go see this guy and see what he's talking about. Right? You're joking. So I go to Columbia University to one of his, sit in on one of his classes, you know, and we engage in conversation. And I tell him, I said, I never realized what to do. He says, what you did, the reason you didn't realize it, he says, because of what you did, people don't think about it while they're doing it. Mm-hmm. And so that's when it came to me. I said, oh, so this is why everybody's interested. The way I live through necessity is what they're teaching as an option now. Mm-hmm. And so they're saying that the open classroom is a new form of learning. And the process is about teaching yourself. Mm-hmm. See, and that's I like exactly that. what I you did. did. That. Yeah. From one garment bag to the next, which yeah. brings me to the Met. Oh, my God. We had a ball. Wow. Okay, so for everybody who's listening or watching, I, I want us to describe the Met for them because not Please. everybody gets the chance to go. And you've been twice. Yes, I've been twice. And I've been three times. Mm-hmm. And I remember last year when we met, I, I made sure, like, I was like, where's Dap? Everything yeah. okay? You good? Yes. Yeah. But then this year, we got to go together. Wow, that was so amazing. Man. I know. Let me tell you first of all. Okay, I was first in, of all. You were so nice that I wasn't used to it. Uh, you know what I mean? I what are you talking about? You know, you called and... and you, you called. You called yeah, me yeah. and you invited me like a proper gentleman. Yes, but that's the second time. I'm talking about the first time oh, we, that we, we came met. Across. Yes, where we met and I went through the... And you called me from the party. Yes. Make sure I was all right because I, I was in... I was in a strange land. <laughs> <laughs> but I know my first time at the Met, I was also in a strange land. And I know what that feels like to go to the Met. Yeah. And so I wanted to make sure that you were taken care of. The Met sealed the deal for me in terms of fashion because it's two people I wanted to meet. Andre Leon Talley mm-hmm. and, and, of course, the Queen. Anna Wintour. The Queen. If I can be acknowledged by the King and the Queen, that seals the deal. You know, and I messed up the first time. I was so nervous. I didn't walk through the right door, so I didn't get to shake her hand. <laughs> so, so I had to wait. Wait, whole... so you didn't go up the stairs? You went to the yeah, right. Yeah, well, I mean, all that excitement, of, you know, the paparazzi all over the place. Because that's what happens when you actually get to the Met. There's a huge red carpet. There's paparazzi on other side. There's people who want to interview you, and it's a little intimidating. But then there's always like someone that's supposed to direct you through the actual museum. And I know that people sometimes get redirected improperly. So my first time, I had walked up the stairs and I was out of breath. I was sweating, out of breath, and then boom, they're all there to greet you, the committee. Mm. And I was like, <sighs> it's so nice to meet you. 
Yeah. <laughs> it was terrible. Yeah. So you're maybe you're better off that you didn't meet them the first time. Yeah, but no, but the amazing part was coming down the red carpet before, you know, you reach the paparazzi, and I'm standing there, and it's just me and Marco Bazzari, oh. the CEO of Gucci. Oh, yeah. And that's a big deal for big me. Big deal. I, and so I'm looking around, the Cardassians is back there, and Madonna's <laughs> over there, and I'm, I'm saying, wait a minute. <laughs> Am I in the right line? <laughs> you know, yep. that was like, before I even got to, to the paparazzi, it was like, I was taken aback. I could not believe what was happening. You know what I mean? This Being was, at the Met is a big deal. Yeah, it was a very big deal. Being a part of the Met and you had a table and you dressed everybody at the table, what was it like to finally be recognized by the fashion industry that they actually saw you for who you were and invited you to come in? I still quite haven't gotten over all of that. I can't even describe it to my friends so, so outside of what we even know. But you know what the big time, but part about all of that that made me realize it, it's just I didn't know how restricted the invitations are. Mm. I don't want to mention names, but I, there were some prominent names that I thought would be able to attend, weren't able to attend. I was surprised. Oh, people you wanted to put at your table. Not even necessarily at my table. I had the people I wanted to put at my table. I okay. like that version. But just the... Um, the way I learned, the things that I learned about, you know, how they... It's a very exclusive how, party. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, these are established, like, people in the industry. So I was like, wow, this is a really big deal. I know. It is. It's the who's who. It's the extravaganza. And, and it's, it's an all-night event. And then you go into the after parties, and that all turns into a thing as well. So, but what I didn't realize, and what I didn't realize until I did all of my DAP research is that when I came in to actually design the dress with you, you gave me full reign over designing the dress. And this is truly who you are. This is who you've been since the 80s. You've yeah. never told anybody what to wear. You've always asked people, what do you want to wear? Yes. And I came in and I showed you a picture of Rihanna wearing a little tuxedo jacket. And mm -hmm. I said, I want to do something like this. And you said, okay, cool. But how are we going to make it dap? And yeah. we started picking out the fabrics and everything. How has your process changed or evolved over the years? Or has is this truly how you work? Fashion, in relationship to fine arts, has a different twist to it, right? I see fashion as primarily something that's transformative, right? And to, for it to be transformative, not just transformative coming from me, but to be able to transform people that I dress. Because mm -hmm. I know I never... Each experience, I'm reliving the first time that I've been able to dress me and to get that feeling. So it's like, you know, you had a great high one day and you keep hitting that high. So everybody who comes, you know, I get the opportunity to transform. And to me, that's the ultimate in fashion, right? And not only that, it keeps you relevant because you are who you dress, mm. you know? And then I give, like, say for instance what I gave to you. I let you play with your ideas. Mm -hmm. And then I'll show you my ideas, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And you see how that came alive? I mean, it was a true collaboration. Yes, it, exactly. It was, and for those of you at home, I mean, I, I feel like I might have been one of the best dressed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, man, I got so much positive <laughs> feedback from that. It was, like, so exciting. It really, oh, I, it was man. my favorite, one of, no, I will just tell you, it's my favorite Met look ever. Yes. It was perfect. Yeah. The beauty of all that is that your input in that. It was like a reflection of yourself. Yeah. Yes. It makes yeah. the person wearing your looks feel even more confident. Yeah. Like, Alec was there the other day, and we dressed Alec for um, the uh, bazaar, the Harbor Bazaar. That's right. Yeah, and she was so excited. She says, I've never been able to do this. I've never been able to come and get to wear something based on me and what I wanted, you know? And I love that. Mm -hmm. I love that. I think that uh, I would like to see a lot of the uh, young designers who come along have as much input that day. I think uh, designers have a tendency to um, be too into themselves. We need them to be creative and to emanate these ideas from themselves, but we need them to embrace as well, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. and, and I think that had a lot to do with certain brands that been around forever mm -hmm. and they lose connection to the to the uh, people who they serve, you know? But yes, I think that's what kept me relevant over the years. I think so. I mean, you've transcended so many different cultures mm -hmm. and uh, looks and 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 you've, you've just kept it you. Mm -hmm. And now talking about the creative process, I wanna talk about how you actually got here today. 
-hmm. there's a quote in your memoir that I love, and it was, I was having trouble sewing my life together, so God made me a tailor. Yes, exactly. Tell us about that. I found the secret, the true secret to life is not only the ability to make yourself happy, but to be able to instill happiness into the world. And fashion allowed me to do that. You know? I always remember when I was in the street and running the streets in the subculture and in the drug culture, and they had a, a drug sweep, right? And in this drug sweep, it took a, a, a whole lot of young people out of the community who were selling drugs. But this was this one young girl who never sold who never sold drugs, right? And she she like refused to. And everybody in her circle did. And I, and I go up to her, I say, wow, they took everybody. They took all your friends. She was 15 years old. And she told me, she said, that's what happens to people who make money off other people's sorrows. Mm. That resonated with me. And I, and I talk about that in the book. That is so amazing, you know? Mm. And so I said, if I ever do something, I want, to do, I want to do something like fashion. Through fashion, I can make people feel good about themselves, mm -hmm. which is the opposite, you know? to what I've seen. That's why I'm so happy about everything that I'm doing now. It's opposite to what I've felt too. I mean, just being on this side of it. And and that's why I feel like anybody who walks into your atelier, you make them feel like family immediately. Automatically. You have family working with you. Exactly. You have family who, you have people working with you who aren't family, who feel like they're family. Yes. And then you're automatically family when you walk in. I mean, it's it's a sense of community. Is that yeah. how also you were raised to just have a sense of community around you? <sighs> the Harlem you know today is the community. But I grew up in the Harlem that was a village. Mm -hmm. You know, you hear people say it takes a village. And yes, it does take a village. Like, I think Martin Luther King was the one that says like, 11 o'clock Sunday morning was America's most segregated hour. And the reason he said that, not in any relationship to racism or anything, because it's just that 11 o'clock Sunday morning is in Harlem, you see everybody, I mean virtually everybody, leaving their houses, going to the different churches. Yeah. It was like so beautiful, man. Now you go to Harlem today, we have these huge, anybody visiting Harlem, please take notice to these huge churches we have. These churches was full full of worshiping people. That's the Harlem that I grew up in, that's the village. And so I'm used to that kind of community. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm used to that village atmosphere and I never allow myself not to have that. So even now, now that I have this luxury store in Harlem, you will find me standing on the corner in front of my store. I know people in my community, the average person in my community can't afford the luxury stuff that I'm on, but I want them to know that I'm a part of them. So that's why you see me standing on the corner greeting people and talking to people and saying hi to people. It's, it's like, a beautiful thing. That's a part of what I think the community should be like and what the community that raised me. An open door, an open hand. Yes. We see Dapper Dan like this every day dressed now, but what was your style like before you were standing out on the storefront greeting everybody? What was my style like? Yeah, oh, was, back oh, okay, in the 80s. Okay. Back even in the 70s, what was your style like? What you see today is a modification of what my style was like now, back then, you know? I like what Alexandro does. Mm -hmm. He, like, adds a flair to it because it's always what we did. Yep. If there's anything that personifies our culture and how we relate to traditional looks, and I did a lot of research on this, it's the zoot suit. What does that one look like? The zoot suit. Okay, let okay, me say. please and, describe and, and it. The zoot suit is so significant because it's a reflection of our culture, all right? And the zoot suits is today is the way that I have done with the major brands, the way I re remix the major brands. So at the great ballrooms back then, when they was dancing in the ballrooms, everybody would dance. But um, the clothes that they were wearing wasn't suitable for the dance. So they used to tie the back of their pants and tie that there. And then the tailors got on and say, let's just make the suit like that. So they designed the zoot suits to fit the way they were dancing, right? This combination of music took place where Dizzy Gillespie and, and, and all the great jazz musicians went down to Cuba and developed this music with the Afro-Cubans that Afro-Cubans are called Afro-Cuban jazz, mm -hmm. right? So the Cubans picked up the zoot suit, right? And the Cubans <laughs> took it into Mexico. So the Mexicans picked it up and took it into 
California. <laughs> and that's when you saw the zoot suits in California. So zoot Philippine. suits was your thing. Like this is what you this were wearing. This was the historic, the biggest historical thing that I could draw on that would explain, you know, this cultural phenomenon that's taking place with hip hop and Gucci, which took place, you know, I'm hip hop in the major brands. Right. You know, but this amazing thing happened, right? The same controversy that took place with the Gucci yeah. and everything and the brands took place with the with zoot suits because this took place like in World War II. Now, in the zoot suits is like the United States government is saying, we don't have enough fabric because the zoot suits take so much fabric, right? Yeah. So anybody got caught wearing a zoot suit was what? considered un-American. This is gone. This is deep. This yeah, is deep. it's considered un-American, and that's what generated the zoot suits riots. Mm. Maybe you'll see me with a, like a Gucci zoot suit. <laughs> <laughs> but fashion, fashion is amazing because if, if you look... Deep enough into it, you can extract so many rich stories. Just like, just like when you were in Liberia and you met that tailor. Exactly. Can you tell everybody oh, yeah. at home oh, about yeah. that time? Because I feel like this was a moment that kind of started to shape. Yes, your that was that style. was very important because um, growing up like out in the streets and with all the street traits, you know, the criminal street traits, and I just decided that I didn't want to be part of that no more, and I just left and went to Africa. And while I'm traveling around Africa, I, you know, naturally was had my dapper, you know, my little dapper look. And I get and I get to Liberia. I had to, went to I went to Zaire, mm. but which is the Congo now, Kinshasa, and for the rumble in the jungle with my when uh, Muhammad Ali was fighting George Foreman. And that then, was your first time in Africa, though, right? That was my second time. That was your second. Okay. Yeah. So I leave um, Zaire, go to. Um, Lagos, Nigeria, and then I end up in Liberia, right? So I'm at the last lap of the trip. So I said, let me get some artifacts. So I go down to the market to get some artifacts, right? And I'm looking at the artifacts. And I say, man, I like this, I like that. And the African tailors look at me up and they say, I like your clothes. I said, oh, yeah? I said, you want to trade? He said, yeah. I ran up in the hotel, got all my luggage. What I need to be coming back to the United States with clothes that I got from the United <laughs> exactly. States. Exactly. So I came back. Traded all my clothes off for the artifacts I which I have in my brownstone in Harlem today. And in addition to that, I had to make me clothes. And this is where the Dapper Dan style. This is why you see, hear me say I blackenized it or I Afri Africanized it. So what I did was with the fabrication they had there and the styles that African Americans wear in the United States, I brought that combination together and had to make me things, and that's what I came back with. And that thought never left me. Mm. So when I came back, later on when I decided to go into fashion, I developed that idea. Mm. And, and, here and therefore are. Dapper Dan was born. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And let yeah. the church say. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then there's another story that I really like in the memoir too, because it's like you took yourself from Africa, and then here you are. You're still you're still um, designing furs. Yeah, I was designing furs. Yes. And a young man comes in, and he's got an LV bag, and yes. everybody starts. They're just dead. Yeah, you know the big thing about that when I changed my life, and you study religion, the further you go back into religion. It all vanishes into symbolism. So I was like mm -hmm. really studying a lot of symbolism. Mm -hmm. So when this guy comes in my store, now this is not just a regular guy. This Who is, is it? the guy. This is Jack Jackson. Jack Jackson was oh. the most important person that come behind Nicky Barnes and and Bumpy Johnson, those really anti-heroes that come out of Harlem, right? And he so, is actually one of your heroes. Him yeah, and yeah he's X. one of my customers, right? Got it. So he comes in with this Louis Vuitton pouch. Full of hundred dollar bills, and I'm looking at the pulse. Everybody's excited. This is Jack, you know, and everybody gets excited about that pouch. And I'm looking at the pouch. I say, Why are they so excited about that pouch? I ain't but five dollars, six dollars worth of vinyl. But what I noticed was the symbols on it is what makes the difference. It's the symbols, you know, the L, the V, the variation of the Eastern Cross. You know what I mean? I say, Oh, that's what it is, right? Imagine. If I can take those symbols and create outfits that have them looking like them bags. Mm. And then the whole idea was born. So from that point on, I taught myself textile printing so that I could, you know, initially I said, I got to get them symbols right away. So I went and bought Gucci bags and Louis bags and cut them up. I said, but this ain't going to work. I can't have nobody look, walking around looking like plastic man. Right, because it was garment bags. Yeah, also, because right? it's that hard vinyl. 
So I said, I have and to teach. And also, it's a little I, sweaty. Yeah. So I said, I have to teach myself how to do this and put this on leather and put this on fabric. So then I started reading books, going to particular trade shows, so that I could, you know, industrial trade shows, so that I could teach myself how to print on leather and different fabrics. Then I came up with this concept that I kept secret where I can print on leather. And then the whole Dapper Day and I did this whole blackenizing luxury brands was born. And then this is where you got the actual title of the father of Logo. Yes. And I was so excited about that. I think, you know, one of my greatest moments was being at the Museum of Modern Art. And the curator at the Museum of Modern Art says to me, he said that you are the most significant person for fashion motifs of the 20th century. You know, mm. I almost fell out in there. I was there. That was like so amazing. It's it's amazing how the artistic community is more welcoming than the general community, man. So that was like a big moment for me. You know? Well, how long have you been doing this? I mean, you're thirty five years. Thirty five, because DAP is seventy five. Sorry, I put you on blast, but this it's remarkable to yeah, see yeah. how long yes you have been doing this. Yes, yes, thirty five years. But, you, you know. You, the big thing is like, and I, w I want everybody to know this, the most important thing is to always prepare yourself to start over. Mm. You know, stay in shape, eat right, exercise, you know? One of my favorite authors is um, Professor Hilton Holtzman, and his, the first book I read by him was um, Man's Higher Consciousness. And in that, he points out, he says, every cell in your body, and this was 1968, 69 when I was reading, he said, every cell in your body will be replaced, you mm. know? And then he goes into how to regenerate the body, right? And this is something the scientist wasn't even saying. Like, this was like the height of metaphysics this guy was. He's part of the Theosophical Society. So not Madame everybody Blavatsky was listening. And all of those guys, who, you know. Take me back to when <clears throat> you first opened your store in Harlem. Do you remember who your first customer was? Of course, because they was locals, you know. But the actual person? Mm -hmm. Um, no, not exact. <laughs> okay, that's yeah. fine. <laughs> I can tell you the first person with money who was uh, who would was make, it? Please let us know. That, that would that would have to be uh that would have to be Jack with okay. the big money, you know. Jack, God, you got to remember, rappers didn't have any money back then. You right. know, they was just starting out. Rap, you know, rap music was just it was the birth of the age of the rap age, you know. And you worked with all of the top rappers, hustlers, athletes, yeah. all of them. Do you all of them. This rappers. might be a really hard question for you just because it would be a hard one for me as well. But do you re do you have a favorite look from the 80s or 90s that you designed? Do I have a favorite outfit that I yes. designed? Yes, the most popular, the one I would consider my most favorite is actually three, but let me tell you why. Okay. The outfits that I did for Eric B and Rakim it's, it looks royal. It's gold and black, and it looks royal. But the most significant thing about it is you can tell from those outfits that I was reflecting who my customers was and not just something I was designing. So Rakim is a 5 percenter. So on the back of Rakim's jacket, I put the 5 percenter sign, which he wanted. Eric B. wasn't a 5 percenter, so I put the Gucci mm. puff patch on the back of him as a reflection of who they are. And those are the two jackets that I, I, and the outfits that I look up to. But in addition to that, I think the most popular of all time is the Louis Vuitton snorkel that I did for uh, what we call a boy wonder, one of the guys who, whose style just defines a particular age group. And that was like a, a, a guy called um, Alberto Martinez or, or Alpo, you know, and, and the jacket that most people identify with Alpo is the snorkel, because the snorkel was a Louis Vuitton, but a soft plonge leather with the I Louis think Vuitton I print. Seeing this. That was phenomenal. So those are the three outfits that really define that age. And then you're in your brownstone. Well, was it a brownstone? The first it is one? a brownstone. Now it is, but the first one was it a brownstone as well? Yes, it was a brownstone, and I still have it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I went through a uh, political stage too, and, and I was trying to get people to understand that gentrification was coming to Harlem. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't get the community to understand it. So, but so I took it upon myself to buy me a brownstone. You know, mm -hmm. I paid fifty thousand dollars for it back then, and today it's worth four million dollars. That's just to show you, you know. So, ten years after having your first store, now we've got Mike Tyson and oh, Mitch Green. Uh, yeah. And yeah. Mike closed Mitch's eye. Yes. He closed it, and then here they are 
in your atelier, yeah. causing all kinds of trouble. They've yes. got mad beef. That changed the whole, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. <laughs> yeah, that best describes it. You know, cause when I was under the radar, none of the brands were uh, aware of what I was doing or how I was doing it. And then all of a sudden, here's a teenage champion, heavyweight champion. Is one of my main customers. And, 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 and this is interesting because I just had a conversation with her today. This is how I met Naomi Campbell. Really? Yeah. She and I have been, she was 19. She came to the store with Mike Tyson. Wow. Yeah, 19. And we talk about a whole career, you know, these separate staircases that we talk. And that's a whole nother subject because Naomi Campbell was on her way up that staircase. Mm -hmm. And I was on my way up the other staircase, you know. And so, uh, yeah, Mike Tyson came with her. Uh, he came with Miss America, um, the lady be first, the second Miss Black America. Oh, wow. Yeah, Mike Tyson. Uh, and they get into a fight. Yeah, but. And but then all of a sudden the cops come. So and now, they now they're generating out. all excitement, right? So he and Mr. Green have fought uh, professionally in the ring, and Mr. Green wasn't happy about the outcome in terms of money, as well as he didn't feel Mike beat him. So I, mean, I had, I'm waiting on Mike. I just made a jacket for Mike Tyson. It's called Don't Believe the Hype. And all the hype <laughs> in the world jump on. The, that's what it was written on the back. Of, he wanted on the back. of Don't Believe the Hype. I didn't realize that he was getting ready to hype me out of the market. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, Thanks, Mike. Yeah. Mitch Green heard that Mike Tyson usually come over my store. So the kids in the neighborhood say, yeah, Mike Tyson whip your butt. He's over the store now. And that's what brought him there that night. Yes, 2.30 in the morning. And I was waiting for him to come pick up his jacket because you know he's open 24 hours a day, 365 days, 10 you, years straight. Your customer service is impeccable. That's right, at all times. So that turned into a street brawl, started in the store, went out to the side of the street brawl. The next morning, it's all over, all the major publications. And then all the brands began to say, who is the dapper dare? Then they all converged on me. And then you had to work underground for 20 years. 20 years. 20 years underground. And then was it 20 years underground and then and then in 2017 is when um, Gucci had redone the Diane Dixon jacket? Well, it's an amazing story. You know, when you look at, if you look at the whole picture, uh, my community and people of color communities throughout the world was up in arms when they saw, when social media came about, when they finally found out where all these major brands, these ideas came from. Because they were they were poaching your ideas. Exactly. Did you even have social media at this point or was it your grandson that showed it to you? Well, you know what? Because I, I only say that because I know your grandson and I know he runs your social media now. Yeah, my grandson was involved in social media, but my son knew, how, my son Jelani, he knew more about what involved this, you know? Mm -hmm. I knew nothing about black Twitter, social media, and that. But my son, uh, Jelani, and my other son, Danny Jr., they were teaching me, you know, like, this is the new thing. And then, Got it. When I, because I saw Tom Ford, I saw uh, Mark Jacobs, I saw that they were using my, my ideas as far back as 2000, you know? And out here was like 2017, 2000. I, I had no voice. So I didn't challenge anything. So social media was your voice. And social media became my voice. Yeah, and they what, stood up for you. And they stood up for me. I would have called this a blessing in disguise. What, what do you call this? I call it a miracle. <laughs> it's nothing short of a miracle because it like transformed my whole life. It transformed my whole life, man. And, and to see this while I'm still you know, eating and breathing is an amazing thing. What does your partnership with Gucci look like today? Beyond anything that I could ever expect. And I tell people this all the time. This partnership is so miraculous that it's more like a dream than a reality. Mm -hmm. So much like a dream, I tell my friends, don't get too close to me because if you pinch me and I wake up, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> yeah, so this whole thing with Gucci, like, I had skepticism in the beginning because I said, nah, why would they reach out like that? But then when I read up on... Marco Bazzari, mm -hmm. and I read up on Alexandro and talked to him and find out the parallels between how Alexandro was coming up and what he faced as being a gay guy in Italy during the 80s. And he told me his story, and I'm a black guy growing up in Harlem during the 80s. You know, it's this, this societal conflicts 
in different different ways, but it was the same type of conflict when you look at the bottom line. And that influenced him, and this influenced me. And then Marco is brilliant mm -hmm. because Marco knew that the age of cultural diversity and inclusivity has to be. It has mm -hmm. to happen. It's inevitable. So between them two, they led the charge to change the whole thing, you know? So I'm, I'm so I was very happy. I'm very happy about the deal. I'm happy for you. I think, mm -hmm. I mean, when you walk in and you see Gucci everywhere in your atelier, it's mm -hmm. a telltale sign that they, they are in yeah. a true collaboration with you as well. Yeah. So you talk about in your memoir this time that made me cry because maybe it's because I'm hormonal right now, mm -hmm. but it was about a time that you and your dad went suit shopping. And oh, yeah. And he said to you, yeah. you can read. Yeah, that's the most powerful moment in my life, you know? I really had to like reflect on it, and I constantly reflect on it. It's, it's, it's never been a time when that wasn't relevant to who I'm talking to, who I'm meeting. That goes with me everywhere, man. I remember, see, my father came up from the South, you know, and he only went to the third grade. Mm -hmm. So that was like in, right after Reconstruction, American Reconstruction, right? And he came up and he never, we never saw any of his family, and uh, I couldn't understand. I said, Dad, how you leave home at 12 years old? People really need to read to understand that. My father left home at 12 years old. But when my father came up in 1910, he was 12 years old. That was right during the Reconstruction when African Americans was leaving the South because, you know, the racial turmoil and the Ku Klux Klan's and all that thing was coming north. So those were the strongest people who left. But that was a typical thing for people of color mm -hmm. to leave at that age and come up, you know. But he only went to, was able to go to the third grade before he left. So when he gets up, he teaches himself how to read, and, you know, and, he, and did a good job, pretty good job. And then we're going to buy a suit one day, right? And it's going to be on credit. I took the contract. I said, Dad, let me see the contract. I took the contract and read it. And at this time, I was in the eighth grade. I, you know, knew the mathematical equation of fi figuring out how much he was going to have to pay. I said, Dad, don't buy this, man. This is going to cost three times what you're going. So we're leaving the store, and we're going down the staircase, right? And my father starts me midway going down and tears welling up in his eyes. And he said, boy, don't you know you could read? Mm. He said, boy, you could read. You know, and at that moment, I didn't understand what he meant. But as I, as I changed, when I changed my life right after that there, I remember what he said. And I read my way out of every problem that I've ever been into. I read my way into fashion. I read my way into gambling. I, read my, I didn't let nothing stopped me. For whatever I learned, I went and got a book, you know? I think that's, it's so remarkable to hear you in, in all the interviews I've listened to and the memoir that I, the parts that I did read. You are a true educator. Yeah. You are about educating yourself, knowing your history, knowing where you come from, exactly. knowing what you're walking into. You want to know about people. Everything. Uh, I've never did recreational re reading. I don't even know what that is. I always <laughs> did directional reading. What is it that I need to know? What books do I have to read to take me on? And I've been religion, politics, and it's all relevant. So, And you see, on The Breakfast Club, I needed to be able to know these things, mm -hmm. to relate to this generation what this partnership meant with me and Gucci, you know? Mm -hmm. How do you have a boycott, you know? How do you, have, how do you boycott a brand and you get nothing? You walk away from a brand with nothing. Historically, that has never happened. People of color have never boycotted. Mm and without results, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and in addition to it, the, the boycott wasn't a valid one anyway. Well, which is why I'm glad that you implemented the system that you did to, what is it that you're doing now? And, and you're talking about um, inclusion and diversity yeah, within and, Gucci. Yeah. Yeah, inclusivity and, and, and diversity. It's a system, yes. And it's a system that you want to create and bring to other fashion brands. Yeah, and to bring to all the fashion brands. I'm, I'm gonna spearhead that, and thanks to uh, Marco and Alexandra, we're doing that today, you know, mm -hmm. and, and this this is like, a, I wish I wish I can encourage people to read, young people to read. This is an argument that goes back all the way back to the turn of the century between Dubois, Frederick Douglass, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and, and the early thinkers, man, you know. Well, I have to say you're a true inspiration. Young, old, black, white, everybody in between. So thank you so mm -hmm. much. Yeah. What is next for Dapper Dan? What I would like to see now is to have people looking at fashion in a different way. Fashion to transform not just individuals, but communities, man. 
And I think that's what's so significant. Either intentional or unintentional, when Alexandria incorporated all these ideas from around the world, you know, that validates who we all are. We all need to tap into that energy and let the whole world know we, we are diverse, you know? But even though we are diverse, we can be inclusive as well. And so that's the charge I want to leave. That's the direction I want to take. Okay, so on Pretty Big Deal, I'd like to do one last thing to close everything up, and it's you fill in the blank. Okay. Okay, you ready? Yes. Okay, fill in the blank. I pretty much always... Take public transportation. Okay. What's the biggest lesson you've learned in the past year? To be in, in charge of my social media myself and not nobody else. <laughs> <laughs> What's the biggest deal you've ever made? My partnership with Gucci. Hey. And finally, you're obviously a pretty big deal. Mm -hmm. But what what is a pretty big deal to you? A pretty big deal for me is to be able to, a deal that would then allow me to create generational wealth for my family. Mm. It's about the legacy and it's about the generational wealth. Yes. Dapper Dan, thank you so much for no, coming thank you. on here. I oh. really appreciate your time. Oh, and I got something for oh, the newborn. Oh, snap. Got something for the newborn. Oh, my gosh. I'm so excited. Should yes. I open it now? Yes, you can. Oh, my goodness. Oh, this is so cute. Okay, everybody listening, I, I have a Dapper Dan for Gucci box in my hand, and it's for the little baby. Oh, oh my goodness. Yep. This is such a perfect onesie. <laughs> Thank, yep. you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. You've been amazing much. for me in so many ways. You're Thank you. I can't Thank you. wait to put my baby in this. Well, I hope you come to the baby shower. Of course. Okay, it's yes. gonna be in November. You, Angelani, and the whole fam. Dapper Dan, thank you so much. And thank everybody you. at home, we want you guys to be a part of the conversation. So make sure you go to hashtag pretty big deal. And don't forget to subscribe on YouTube. And don't forget to go to Instagram and Twitter at pretty big deal pod. We wanna hear from you. And we also want you to talk to Dap a little bit. So we'll see you soon.